streaming application using Mobius. If you're wondering what Mobius is, it's a new name, new brand for uh, Sparkler. Sparkler is a name, Spark CLR is a name we used in uh, the meetup announcement. So since then, we have been kind of uh, about Mobius from now on. So before we begin, quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of Sparkler or the C-Sharp API for Spark before the Spark uh, that meetup announcement? Before. Microsoft, yes. <laughs> and, um, and how many of you use uh, C Sharp or uh, .NET for uh, day-to-day work? It's a good number. Um, so as you can mention, this uh, project is about adding the C Sharp language binding for Spark that allows you to uh, use C Sharp and build your Spark applications. So if you are uh, dealing with the uh, .NET C Sharp day-to-day work, if you would like to build Spark applications with C Sharp, um, we have an option available now. So let's begin. This is what the agenda looks like. We're going to look into the background <coughs> on the project, how we got started, the motivation, etc. And then we'll look into the architecture of uh, the C Sharp API implementation. Uh, we we'll look at some sample code, a sample driver program implemented uh, in C Sharp. And with time permits, we'll have a demo, quick demo. It's going to be a simple demo, so don't have any expectations. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, we'll, uh, the demo will be very simple. But it just shows how integrated it is with your standard C Sharp development workflow, which is like Visual, Visual Studio, stepping through the code, and all those things. Like everything is supported. So it's not like something like a script that you write and you can't, uh, it's completely different than your normal C Sharp development workflow. This is like developing any C Sharp application. That's very simple. Uh, so the demo will focus on that part, not necessarily the logic of uh, the driver code or how uh, uh, the interaction works behind the scenes. Towards the end, we'll have Remy cover the uh, early lessons on implementing uh, Spark streaming application using modules. <laughs> join the C-Sharp uh, API development community for Spark. As you might know, we just started building this uh, C-Sharp API. So uh, any participation would be great. So what I mean by that is uh, you can develop applications using C-Sharp, Spark applications using C-Sharp and provide feedback to drive what goes into the upcoming releases of Mobius. Or better yet, if you want something uh, supported in Obvious, you can contribute to that. Again, uh, it's an open source project, so contributions are welcome. And your contributions does not, does not have to be a code. It can be documentation, contribution, you can write samples, you can uh, build examples showcasing uh, integration between Mobius and uh, some other .NET uh, technology. Uh, any, any contribution is welcome, bug fixes, uh, or even imagination. Any, any contribution is great. So I request you to join the community um, and help uh, take this forward. Let's look at the target scenario. What prompted us to start building the C-Sharp API for Spark? So one of the scenarios that we have in, uh, uh, in, our, uh, in Microsoft is to do the near-time near -time processing of green logs. We also call it as fast as a month. Uh, it's, uh, it produces, like Bing produces lots and lots of logs, as you can imagine. And uh, processing it in real time, producing high quality results, producing timely results is a challenge. Uh, so this, this, this implementation uh, powers several downstream scenarios. So once this uh, log is processed, uh, and the data is made available, uh, the downstream consumers uh, use it for their own business needs. So here you see some of the downstream scenarios, like using the click signal to uh, improve the relevance of uh, results, operational intelligence, as you can imagine, and then back to the There are lots of scenarios that cover it. So essentially what I'm trying to communicate here is that this is a very, very critical pipeline for uh, running BIN and the business at Microsoft. So uh, 
So that is the scenario that we had in mind, uh, which kickstarted the whole process of building the C-Sharp API for Spark. Uh, so this is my team's target scenario. Then we had another uh, team that had a different scenario in mind, but still, uh, they had this need for C Sharp API. Uh, that team uh, had this interesting <coughs> scenario. Uh, it's about querying the Cosmos logs. So we got together and we started working on this project. Uh, that's how the whole thing started. So these are the implementations of Fastasimo, the scenario. I'm, no, I'm aware of at least two different implementations available. Probably there are more. Uh, so the one involves uh, Microsoft internal low latency transaction storage in the platform. Um, I don't know if there is any details that outside, uh, so I'm afraid from going into the details. Uh, so that's one implementation. The other implementation is based on Star, Kafka, and then uh, in memory the streaming analytics engine, which is internal to Microsoft. Uh, Star, uh, we use SAP.NET, it's uh, a C sharp wrapper for uh, Star. Uh, it was internal to Microsoft at some point. Uh, I believe it's also available now to external customers as a part of HTML safe offering in Azure. So, so we have these two implementations for, for fast assembly. As with any system, these implementations have their own, have their own limitations. Okay, there's no system with any limitation. So these systems have some limitation. Uh, so we were looking into options, other options. You know? One, you know, we can keep improving. Uh, I want to uh, work or address the limitations in these implementations. Alternatively, we can try to see if there's anything else that we can leverage. So obviously Spark came to our mind. So we started asking a question, can Spark help here? Can we leverage Spark to build this near real-time processing uh, pipeline to process big blocks? We said, oh yeah, it seems like a reasonable option. So after we decided to build this uh, uh, pipeline using Spark, the question became, how can we reuse the existing investments that we have made in fast as well? As I mentioned, it's a very critical pipeline. Lots and lots of uh, development hours have been put into that. Years, years of their work uh, is involved in building these pipelines. So uh, the question became, can we reuse those existing investments, specifically speaking, the .NET libraries? that were used to build these pipelines, can we reuse the investments? And that's when the, the topic of C Sharp API, C Sharp support to Spark came. So there was no support for C Sharp uh, uh, when we were discussing the options. So we said, OK, let's, let's build it. What if we build the C Sharp API and then build the pipeline using, uh, using the API that we built? So building the bridge as we go. He said, okay, let's do it. So that's the uh, kind of background. To summarize the motivations, the, the motivations for C Sharp API is the twofold. One is enabling organizations like Microsoft that are invested deeply in .NET technologies to leverage Spark. Spark has this huge momentum. So yes, companies like Microsoft that's trying to reach out in pace traditionally. Uh, they want to leverage Spark, what are the options? Not much. So with the support by building C-Sharp API, we wanted to enable them to do that. Just build Spark applications using C-Sharp, what the developers are used to. And it's not just about uh, letting them build, enabling them to build C-Sharp as Spark applications from scratch. It's also about reusing the existing libraries they may have. Like what I mentioned uh, for us. So we have this library that is used for fast SML and we want to use it. So same way other uh, organizations or other teams in Microsoft that have similar need, we wanted to uh, enable them use the C Sharp API and build the applications. C Sharp is Spark applications. Looking at the goal, once we decided to kind of build the API, the goal was to make C Sharp a first class system for the Spark applications. That means the API should allow folks to build bad jobs, training jobs, as well as uh, SQL jobs that's available in Spark. As I mentioned, streaming was our primary scenario, uh, but to support streaming, 
So having support for the batch jobs of RDBs was foundational. So I guess most of you are familiar with Spark. So P stream is essentially a sequence of RDBs. So underlying it's essentially a batch. Uh, so supporting batch jobs is foundational. We had to support that. And then once we added the batch job support, the streaming support, adding the support for data frames was just in the It wasn't, uh, didn't need like, too much extra investment to make it possible. So that's how uh, we uh, decided on the scope of our work. So this is the scope as of today. We've changed. Uh, folks have like, expressed interest in having c sharp language binding for other Spark packages. For now, the focus has been on these three areas. <coughs> Let's look at the design considerations we had in building C sharp API. So the first thing is the interop between JVM and CLI. Spark needs JVM to run, and if we have to uh, build support uh, build a C sharp API. Uh, allowing folks to uh, specify C sharp implementations for data processing. That means CLR to run. So we need some way of interoperating between CLR and JVM. So that was our first primary design consideration. Um, later, later during the talk, I will say I will cover what option we went with and uh, how it is working for us. Um, but that was the first thing that we uh, had to uh, address. The second thing is what we implement and what we use. Spark has already implemented lots of things. Um, reading from different sources, caching, other systems, all those things are already covered in Spark. Uh, there's no point in implementing it. So we had to come up with a way to kind of wrap it so that we don't re-implement all these operations, but at the same time support them in the API. And lastly, we do not want to be in anything. There are, there are already uh, two existing language bindings, Python and R for Spark. And they have traveled the path of adding these language bindings and uh, the framework that is needed to make the language binding uh, possible. So we decided to reuse uh, the design as well as code that possible in implementing this third new language binding. <coughs> The C-Shop API uh, architecture looks like this. The apps that use the C-Shop API, those are the executables that uh, developers would build in Visual Studio, like how they would build any uh, C-Shop application in Visual Studio. And that would depend on this library, the C-Shop API, Mobius uh, DLL, to build their application. All they had to do was reference this DLL, a uh, set of DLLs, and then build their applications. But behind the scenes, the C-Sharp API library depends on PySpark implementation and also the Java and Scala public APIs. I'll cover where we use Python implementation. Uh, and then the Python implementation is used in only one place, but the rest of it is using the uh, public API available for uh, Java and Scala. So that's the difference. Let's look at the word count example implementation in C sharp. So this probably is familiar to you. This is the word count example available for Spark. It's a very simple uh, private program. Loads data from a text file, gets the individual words, performs a count, and saves it to a text file. Very simple application. And this exact same uh, private program can be implemented using C sharp. And that would look like this program. The only difference would be in the conventions that you use. C sharp has different conventions. So that would be different. And then some of the constructs would be different. Let's see how it looks. So this is what it looks like in C sharp. The first line, loading for text file, is exactly the same thing. There's a little difference in terms of uh, method name convention. But other than that, flat map, reduce, map, everything is exactly the same. There are a few, few differences here, minor differences here. For example, the key value pair. You don't see the key value pair in Scala because of the implicit conversion. Any uh, two item couple is converted to key value pair in Scala, but in C sharp we have to make it explicit. Because the next step after the map that you see here, the next step is reduce, reduce the key. So we need the key value pair. 
and so it's explicitly defined. But essentially it's the same thing. Semantically it's the exact same thing, just that the weight is expressed in C sharp is different. So yeah, so that's an example of uh, a C sharp, simple C sharp application. Um, that's uh, you can see that you know, it's similar to the Scala implementation. So if your uh, our goal is that there is a C sharp program, a Scala program, a Java program for Spark, which one should be able to copy that version. So you make some minor modifications, compile and run. It should be as simple as that. Everything else, everything should be the same uh, in terms of the method syntax, method names, everything. Uh, that's a goal. Um, I think. Uh, you would see, like, you know, if you have seen the API, you would see that it's pretty much a replica of the public API available in uh, Scala. Exactly. Let's look at the uh, intro. I mentioned that the intro between JV and CLR was the first design consideration we had. So let's look at that in detail. So this diagram is probably familiar to all of you. So there's a driver uh, side. Part a set of workers, so driver side details this context, and then uh, anytime an action is called, the tasks are distributed uh, to the workers, they get executed in the worker side, and then uh, optionally, uh, the results can be collected back to the driver side. So that's the standard uh, spark setup. Let's see how the CLR, the JVM drop works in this case. The driver side, <coughs> they just implemented a program. So that is the entry point here. So that drives everything. Uh, so the user code doesn't even know the existence of Java. They don't use the with any Java APIs. They just write C sharp code. And behind the hoods, if the CLR interoperates with the JVM uh, to perform what is needed. So if you look at this implementation, C sharp driver doesn't know the existence of Java side. The Java side doesn't know that there is a C sharp drive side that is driving or uh, you know uh, defining what needs to be done, or the transformations and the executing the actions. So they are kind of they don't they are they're not aware of each other, and uh, this communication happens through uh, sockets. Most of the times it's one way, like C sharp side sends uh, messages to the Java side uh, JVM to execute stuff, Spark stuff. Uh, but in some cases, like for example, collect. When you have to collect the results, the data has to flow back to CLR. CLR. So that's why that's right. But most of the time, the driver side, you can think of it as C-sharp, driving JVM, and uh, that's kind of a very simple way to do that. So the worker side, it's kind of similar, but it's the other side. So executor launches CLR only when it is needed. Let's say there's a C sharp operation the user has defined in map. And that has to be executed. That needs CLR. So in that case, CLR is lost. And then this data, data is sent back and forth between uh, JVM and CLR. How the executor manages the memory used by C sharp worker? Yeah. So it's a sub, a sub process. So since the C sharp exe is a sub process, it should like it should be covered under the one of the memory constraints. So is that taking out of the full amount when you specify small executors or the amount of uh, memory that you uh, specify? It should be another, yeah. Okay, so it's So the box explains what is the standard part uh, uh, setup and the uh, idea is that as long as the driver machines and worker machines support launching CLR, it can, this setup can work, c sharp API can work with that setup. Uh, now the question is, does it work in the next? Uh, so we, we have not spent extensively uh, like figuring out uh, where, how uh, efficient it is in the next, but our control integration system Runs the build in the next, it runs the function test. So it works, just that we have not done uh, enough experimentation or exploration to uh, understand more about the implications of using C sharp to see if the API in the next using one. Uh, it's like that was that. 
So the reuse part, I mentioned we try to reuse the design and code from uh, the existing language bindings as much as possible. So this slide covers bad reviews. So in the driver side, the, intro, the interaction between uh, C sharp driver and the Java driver, uh, JVM driver, uses an API server. Uh, that implementation is similar to how R binding works. Uh, Python binding has a different uh, way of uh, interpreting. We use Py4j, but R implementation uses the same, uh, same model. On the worker side, we use PySpot implementation, not just the design, we use the implementation. So C sharp RDD inherits from Python RDD. So Python RDD is generic enough uh, to launch a separate process, serialize the data, get the data back. It does the whole thing. Uh, it has nothing specific to Python. Uh, so we are just reusing the same implementation uh, by inheriting from uh, Python RDD and then having some extra debug uh, statements there. But other than that, it's the same implementation we are using. And the logs would show Python RDD. So we are using the implementation from Python, but then the design from uh, R for the driver side. So let's look at what C sharp RDD is. So C sharp RDD is created when there is a C sharp operation that needs to be uh, executed. If there is no C sharp operation, for example, like reading, loading from a text file and performing a count, this does not involve any C sharp operation. And in that case, CLR is not even involved. There is no CLR implementation. There is no, no not even C sharp RDD. <coughs> loading from a file. That will be Hadoop RDD behind the scenes, and then that is in the JVM, and then count is performed on that RDD. So there's no C sharp RDD. But let's say you're reading from a file and then converting every line to uppercase, calling two open on every single line. So that is a lambda, C sharp lambda that the user will specify in the private program, and that needs CLR basically. So at that time, C sharp RDD is created behind the scenes. And when C sharp RDD is created behind the scenes at the worker side, that means CLR will be launched and then the serialization uh, and everything happens. So C sharp RDD essentially is an RDD of byte array. It stores the serialized objects. And uh, that's what gets, gets passed around. I mentioned that the data is serialized and sent to the worker process. Uh, you might wonder the performance impact of that. That is, that is definitely a performance cost because anytime you, assume, you do serialization and serialization, there is some cost associated. But the, but the good thing here with uh, this implementation is that these transformations are pipeline. So let's say you do like two maps and one filter, uh, and everything needs some C sharp uh, operation. Everything needs some C sharp operation. You're doing two upper in the first one, uh, first map, let's say in the second map you're uh, splitting the columns, and in the filter you're uh, filtering for columns greater than five upper. So these, all these operations <coughs> need CLR to execute because all the lambdas are C-sharp lambda. Uh, but if serialization doesn't happen, or the data doesn't go between JVM and CLR three times, even though there are three steps involved. If it happens once, and then all these steps are pipeline, so the execution happens in the worker side, and then data is sent back to the Meaning that there is some cost, but the unnecessary serialization and deserialization is avoided by the pipeline. I mentioned about the next support. Uh, we use Mono to uh, support uh, building uh, our API uh, in the next as a part of uh, we use Travis CI for the link to build with. Unit tests and functional tests are run. So functionally it works. And uh, we have not experimented uh, with the uh, real cluster and then understanding the program and stuff. <coughs> but it works. Let's look at uh, the driver side in crop, little more detail. We are going one step down in the crop. Uh, we saw the overview of the drop in the driver side and the worker side. I would say one level down. This is for data frame. 
So the interaction uh, in the uh, for RDDs and DStream is kind of similar. DStream is a little special, but uh, RDD is mostly the same in the driver side. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to just cover the data frame interaction. So there is this JVM CLR. Let's see how it interacts. So the entry point for the C# -sharp application is JVM. So uh, like the way Spark summit uh, is the entry point to summit in a Spark application, we have Sparkler summit command. The arguments everything is the same as uh, Spark summit. But the only thing is instead of specifying a class here, the user will specify an executable because the user builds an exe uh, in this video. Uh, they build uh, exe uh, using the API. So that exe is what that is passed to the Spatter summit, but then the rest of the arguments are the same. So C sharp runner takes those arguments. The first thing it does is it launches the uh, C sharp backend. The C sharp backend is the NP server that we talked about, the driver side. So it, it is a proxy for all the JVM calls. It launches this backend and then gets the port, port number, and then it launches the driver exe, driver executor. Uh, so the driver exe now knows the port number to connect to the C-sharp backend. So it connects to the backend. Uh, any, any, any operation that is done on the C-sharp side, the driver program, <coughs> that can be translated to some method call in the JV. For example, creating SQL context. The driver code initiate, uh, initializes SQL context in the C-sharp side. So that gets translated to JVM calls and uh, SQL context is created between the scenes in JVM. And the SQL context in the C-sharp side has a reference to the JVM uh, SQL, uh, SQL context. So that any further operations in SQL context in the C-sharp side can be executed on the JVM also. For example, creating data frames. So that again, that gets translated to uh, a call in the JVM and the data frame is created in JVM. So now you have uh, now you have the data frame in the C sharp side, which essentially wraps what's in the JVM, and uh, the data frame in the C sharp has reference to the JVM. So any further operations on the data frame in C sharp gets translated to the similar or uh, semantically equivalent calls in JVM. So any operation gets involved in the JVM, and then the data frame. Uh, the JVM uh, is used to execute the uh, same uh, other calls. So that's how it works, the JVM and then the driver side. So this is for data frames. Let's look at what happens in the executive side for RDD. Note that this is for RDDs. Uh, the reason uh, using RDD instead of data frame is because RDD is where uh, the worker side is use worker side versus uh, uh, CLR anyway. So data frame, most of the operations, as long as you don't use any UDFs in data frames, the execution is purely JVM. There's no CLR, nothing. But then in RDD API, that's where you specify the lambdas in map and filter. So it needs uh, CLR to be executed. So that's why I picked RDDs here uh, to show what happens in the executor side. So there's C sharp RDD, and that is created every time there is a C sharp lambda that is used. And when Spark calls compute on C sharp RDD, it knows that it has to launch uh, an external process. In our case, it is a C sharp portrait on EXE, and then send the data over, and the data gets processed in the uh, worker side. And uh, the processing essentially is what is specified in the uh, uh, implementation map of the water which is quite that lambda is serialized also sent to the worker. So data and then the function that needs to be applied on the data, both are available in the worker side now. So C sharp <coughs> takes that and then does the processing and then the, finally the data is sent back. So as I mentioned, C sharp RDD depends on Python RDD, it gets from that. And uh, again I want to mention that if there is no C sharp transformation and no C-sharp UDFs in data frame, then CLR is not involved. It's purely JVM based. So are these sockets transformed from 
I'm not sure, like I don't completely understand the question. Uh, these new standard sockets, and we send data across. Uh, I don't know, uh, does anybody have a facet to the question? So that being my honor, the question is, uh, does the socket you see go from user to user? Uh, so is it like, are these typically the large copy of questions of data that are taking place? Are these low copy of those that are seeing data before and that can show? I don't know what the C-sharp implementation use. We use C-sharp sockets. We use a fast TCP fast loop. Is it fast, fast loop? loop? Yes, we use fast loop. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think the question is, are you taking advantage of zero sample? Yeah. So that is mentioned that we use fast loop. Uh, so yes. Uh, and uh, that's, that's available in like, some versions of JVM, I guess. Yes. I mean, the version of JVM, pretty much we, Microsoft contributed to JVM. So like, I mean, the certain version of JVM, actually on, on, at our, uh, Website, I mean, at our GitHub site, you will see that version at Microsoft contributed, public available, and then support the TCP fast loop. Quickly, what Daniel said, Microsoft contributed to uh, uh, JVM uh, for this fast loop implementation, and uh, if that uh, JVM uh, fast loop is used, then it should be available. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, performance considerations. Uh, Again, there is some cost, but you try to minimize the cost by pipelining, and uh, there is no unnecessary deserialization or deserialization. Uh, so the other thing to note is that persistence is handled by JVM. They have not implemented persistence uh, or like import, speed inputs or anything back over. So everything happens in the JVM side. We just provide the wrapper uh, so that the driver can call these methods. So anytime. Uh, caching or checkpoint being done on RDD, that impacts the pipeline. Because pipelining is done, it's for uh, you know, combining pipeline the executions in the executor side, but then the checkpoint happens on the preview side. So that uh, pipelining is uh, impacted when the caching happens. Um, so the Python has the same uh, limitation. So since uh, we inherited the design for Python and the implementation, uh, we inherited the limitation also. Uh, so that's something that to be aware of. When building applications using C sharp API. And data frames, if there is no UDFs, no serialization, deserialization, no C sharp, no CLR, nothing happens, the execution is fully within JVM, and the performance will be similar to that of native Scala uh, and program. So that's uh, the implementation details under the code. But then now, now let's look at the status. Um, we have uh, two releases so far. One is uh, version 1.5.200, that supports part 1.5.2. Another is the new release for 1.6.0. The next release will probably uh, be for 1.6.1. And uh, we have other things working on. We are working on other things like version backup scenario, app, scenario, API, and then uh, we are also doing the work that's part. This is the project control. Uh, it's available, it's open source, available in GitHub. <laughs> Contributions are welcome. Any contribution is fine. Uh, we have uh, we leverage services like AppWare for continuous integration in Windows, Travis for uh, Linux uh, continuous integration, Core Coverage, Core Cal for uh, Core Coverage analysis and measurement. It's under every license. And there are several options to uh, engage with the community. Stack Overflow, what we have, uh, or we have groups established. We did chat. Room is also available. It's a Slack room also available. Those are the options. If you want to look at more about the API usage, the repo has a couple of options. One option is to go look at the samples we have. So samples is a comprehensive set of uh, APIs. So any API that, that is built for uh, in C sharp, we have added that to sample. So sample not only uh, demonstrates the usage of the API. It also doubles as a function test for us. So it's comprehensive, pretty much every, every API as a uh, sample uh, or uh, test, functional test available in the samples product. But then there are also examples for it. So examples are standalone for Samples is a huge project, a uh, few different uh, tests are available, implementations are available. Uh, we also wanted to provide simple, standalone examples that one can kind of uh, use as a template to start building applications. So examples folder is a good place to uh, start. 
So we have uh, four or five examples right now, but more can be added, and that's a good place to start if you want to start contributing. So the next example can be from you. So consider contributing. The other thing to compare the Scala and C Sharp APIs is to look at the performance test we have implemented. So there is a, a performance test suite, and that suite uh, includes Java, Scala, and then the C Sharp implementation. So you should be able to open both side by side and look at how the APIs look in these two different implementations. So that's another thing. So these are the options to look at the API usage, and then the API, API documentation is also available in uh, GitHub. Let's look at a few examples uh, before uh, we go into the, the streaming, uh, uh, streaming uh, part of the talk. So this is a very easy example. This example just loads data from a table, shows a schema, and then performs a count. The Scala implementation would look exactly like this. Uh, so I just want to show you this, uh, how close it is to Scala implementation and then also show how to uh, perform a JDBC application uh, from uh, c -sharp. So the next example will be uh, XML processing. So Spark XML package from database is used here. So here to specify the uh, package uh, that, that needs to be used to load or read the data and then provide input here. It uh, uses the standard data frame API to load the XML file, uh, load the XML data as a data frame, and then standard data frame like show schema, count is used here, select, again another data frame API is used here, and then the data is written back using the uh, standard data frame API. So here this example, go C sharp, lambdas, right? So this execution, when this is run, it's purely JVM based from the worker side. There is no scalar launch, no serialization. This is an event of example. Uh, I cannot tell you that you can have it up as uh, implementation. The use case is similar to that of Kafka. So, uh, pop sub system uh, available in Azure. And uh, so, this example shows how the streaming implementation can be done using event hub. So, event hub parameters are defined and then uh, create a streaming context. Five, uh, the five second uh, duration, get the checkpoints, read the data, and then perform uh, some operations here. So essentially, here it translates the bytes get from event hub to string, and then uh, looks for strings with a comma, and then identifies the columns, and then it gets extracts a few columns and then performs something here. Um, so, it's standard uh, streaming application. But it uses even uh, we'll also We also have, uh, we will add a Kafka example soon. We don't, want, we don't have it uh, added to the code yet. We are working on uh, the Kafka implementation. We need uh, the large scale implementation that we are going to talk about in a few minutes. But uh, it's not, there is no simple example available for Kafka yet in the report. And we can expect that soon. So now let's look at uh, one uh, scenario. Uh, scenario is that there are two log files. The first log file and the fixed log file with uh, Buid as a common field that can be used to join these two logs with some dimensions and metrics. Uh, let's see how uh, uh, Spark with uh, this API can be used to implement a simple log processing uh, solution using RDEs, data frames. <coughs> the first step is loading data from the files. So, text file API is used here, the data is loaded. Put it there, and then the next step is to get the user columns splitting. Once the rows are read, split the comma, and then get the user columns. So here, this is the lambda. So when you use a lambda, C sharp RDE is involved behind the scenes, and if C sharp RDE is involved behind the scenes, there will be a CLR uh, invocation in the worker side. So, uh, so that happens uh, when this gets executed in the worker side. The next step is doing a join. So the previous step, here we are creating a key value pair. So key value pair is essential to do the join. So the next step is join. So we are creating a key value pair, both in uh, the request log and the matrix log. This performs a join. Again, standard uh, Spark API. Uh, 
RE dot join XRED, and then we do further transformations. So here the transformation is once it is joined, create this join row, join record uh, that happens here, and then computing the max you can see by data center. So here we are doing another transformation with data center as the key and then the latency as the value because we want to reduce by data center. So that happens here and then max is the method that we want to execute. So that's uh, the scenario uh, where we are processing log files, joining, and then getting computing and uh, computing some metrics. So this computes the average metrics. The previous one is for max. This is the average. Now let's see how it is done using data frame API. So the previous one, uh, C-sharp lambda is involved. So there is CLR, and uh, there is uh, serialization, deserialization, cost, all those things. But with the data frame, the exact same thing can be done using data frame API. And that's how it looks. One, it is concise. Second, it doesn't use any C-sharp operation or transformations. That means the operation is purely JD. So if you're familiar, you'll see that you know, like loading from text file, selecting columns, selecting two columns, and then doing a join here, and then getting like max and average grouped by data center. So simple implementation. And this is the yeah, alternate implementation using data frame using temp tables. So we have two temp tables, and then execute a query to get max and average at the same time. This is the third option is to specify the schema. The previous here the schema is inferred, but uh, this, this example shows how you can specify the schema when loading uh, data from file. All right, so that's all uh, I wanted to cover uh, for the Mobius implementation. What's under the hood? What are the implications of using RDP API versus data frame API? And performance considerations you need to have when building uh, your Spark applications is Mobius. So now I'm going to pass it on to Winnie to talk about the lessons learned uh, using uh, in building Spark streaming application, large scale uh, Spark streaming application using Mobius API. Just speak up. Okay. Let's uh, jump to lesson one. So use objects play by key to join these strings. So let's first to, uh, take a look at uh, the target use case. Uh, you want to merge, click and impressions, conversion to Kafka streams within a uh, uh, different kind of window. So here we want to actually join the uh, impressions with joins uh, with uh, clicks during the lifetime, during the lifetime, lifetime of impression. So why not use the join API which is designed for the purpose? The problem is uh, um, application time required in this use case is not supported in uh, Spark here. So the window operation I use in this sample from uh, Spark documentation. It's uh, based on what which is uh, not always in the same thing as the So, uh, the so, so it's not really possible for the uh, join API API to fully meet our needs. If not this I new mean, join API, uh, the API can actually be used. So the answer is the update stay by key. So in this update by key API, uh, join of the operation is passed as a, a parameter. Uh, so uh, within this particular, uh, within this join function, you can enforce the uh, application time uh, based window operation. 
So here's how the update state IP works. <coughs> so after the update IP is actually maintains partially, takes partially joined events uh, as a state and uh, passed from current batch jobs because streaming job is actually a bunch of uh, uh, streaming batch, so you can pass that state across the batch only onto the next job if it's not done yet. I mean, if it's not done, I mean, um, if the event lifetime not expire yet. So, with this one, I mean, th this is exactly what we want to do. And, uh, and actually, I mean, any um, a free time based join should be, should be using I mean, this uh, update state by key uh, API instead of the uh, join API. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here actually write a stream application. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay. So if uh, no questions are done, I will move on to the next question. Uh, I'm going to be positioning for Kafka Direct. So the Kafka Direct approach is highly recommended for reading data from Kafka. There is something called uh, there's some a receiver based, based approach, um, um, which is not recommended today. Uh, if you want to do more detail, we can I mean, talk, discuss on that. So what's the problem here? So while we're running a streaming job, we observe that um, there are unbalanced conditions, couple conditions, and uh, some kind of insufficient conditions. I mean, the date, Kafka data is under distributed. So these two problems can I mean, significantly and slow down streaming job. So unbalanced condition meaning uh, some of the, a few, only a few of the conditions has more small data than others. So say two or three times more than average. So it seems a uh, streaming job always waiting for uh, the bias to continue to compute before it can move on to the next stage. So this unbalanced condition and significantly and unnecessarily slowed up the overall job in streaming job, uh, delay uh, in streaming job. So insufficient conditions means um, you have to, uh, I mean, I mean the per partition data size is too big. Mm -hmm. So causing the downstream processing RDD not being able to keep up with the incoming data. So, so what's the solution here? So of course, you can use I mean, the distributed uh, API compute condition. So you can the recondition and sharpen it, and sharpen it. After, after you read the update from Kafka, but this turns out to be inefficient, so we can see uh, some side-by-side -side comparison data. So we come up with this uh, solution called Kalevi condition. Meaning, if the a partition size is too big, we're going to split into multiple additive partitions. So when the job actually running, there are some multiple tasks, I mean, uh, reading data from a single large partition. So we get better distribution at the right now. So this repartition is uh, on the uh, topic base. So we, we, because uh, different topic can have different traffic patterns. So we have to, uh, Okay. This is the configure. Once you configure it, you can see it at the time. Uh, we actually talk, uh, talk about this with one of the computers uh, in this part of the So uh, we'll buy a Jira, this one, to, uh, to deal with this issue. So let's take some, take a look at uh, some side-by-side uh, -side comparison. So we, we run a side-by-side uh, -side job while with the language we condition, while with, I mean, the, native repartitioning API. So without that dynamic repartitioning, so you, you can, uh, sorry about the, the graph is not very clear, but you can barely see the lines above the threshold, which is the terminating time, uh, terminate time job interval. Meaning the job cannot finish within the <coughs> two job interval. So you, you get the delay piled up. Uh, it actually takes more than, I mean, the average is three minutes of time to finish. So after we apply this dynamic repetition, so you can see the average 
in closer to time of job cut. So the job can finish within the job interval, which is two minutes. So it turns out it's, uh, this, I mean, recording the works are pretty good. And because we understand, because, because we understand the problem is because uh, the start streaming has some dependency. So it, it do one, one, one to one value between quality and a couple of conditions. So that limits the, limits the, I mean, the computing power. So we, we have the computing power, but this value and dependency not being able to use benefit from that power. Okay, these are the two short lessons we learned. Quick question: If if one consumer is reading from uh, the same partition, like multiple consumers are reading from the same partition, yeah. um, don't they are they reading the full data set, <coughs> or mm. or they are uh, what, how come they are not overlapping on the offsets? They read from different uh, offsets, right? Yeah, there's a there's a there's a uh, receive approach with the web approach. Because it's a DWA approach, so basically by default, Simple each partition is read by one task. So not like a receive approach. Receiver will have the offset coordination. No, but I'm talking about the dynamic repartition. Didn't you say that uh, multiple consumers would read from the same partition because yes. you know you have an unbalanced partition, so there's right. a lot of data in that partition. Right. So to scale out, you said multiple consumers would read from that. Yeah. So are multiple consumers reading the full set or? So, so then how are they reading slice of it because... They're split into multiple offset range. So, so hold on a second. This is a repartition is data is still by one reader, still one reader. But we actually create multiple RDD. So there's more than one task to handle the data already retrieved oh, from right. Kafka. So still one reader reading from Kafka, but more than one task to handle the data right. to keep up. That so reading cool. has no issue, yeah. but processing falling behind. Right. All right. All right. That makes sense. Follow-up question, so each RDD is basically potentially consuming only partial data, or like, like even or odd, you're basically multiplexing it within different RDD? Yes. So again, a follow-up question. So in this case, the state management is within the spark, right? It's not relying on the Zupi for offset management. Uh, the state management, yes, that's right, exactly, yes. Yes. So do you foresee, I mean, for standard tools, for code, should we do it from Kafka partition? Which actually use the Kafka Zupi to see how the consumers are catching up with the producers. Because the, in this case, the consumer offsets are within the spark. So, your standard relation. I, uh, I think there are two parts to it. I think we need to update it. Zupi, what about tools we have manually? So, as part we said, so we may want to push back the external system. So, yes, you're right, but uh, that's the yeah, the state is actually uh, maintained, taken care of by the technology system. With this part. Uh, but if your lag is still in Kafka, right? Or do you still have your lag in Zookeeper? Like the, the reader lag is still in Zookeeper or is it in Spark? Spark. Uh, Spark for reading. We still rely on Spark for, for reading the from Kafka. From, from Kafka. Okay. Want to flip next? Next slide? No, wait, not next slide, just finish it. It's not guaranteed. There's always a try. There's always effort put in to try to balance the, the producer. But there's not guarantee. Even if you try very hard, you still see it sometimes one partition will have more data. So, so it depends upon your partitioning strategy, right? Like if you're doing a round robin, then you can uh, pretty much. Uh, Just click one more. Click one more. Thank you. No, no, click one more. Oh. 
By the way, we, we will have time after the presentations if you have more questions or things to discuss with Karthik and Raymond. 